Hello, everybody, and welcome to the July 25th Trips and Traps. Andy Serling, joined by Eric Otter. Our first episode from Saratoga 2013, and always great to be up here because, well, it's Saratoga in the first place, and secondly, if you like to bet trips or you like to bet race scenarios back, you get tons of that up here. You get a lot of turf races with big fields. You get a lot of two-year-old races, so why don't we get started? Absolutely. All right, the first race we'll uh, get uh, started with here is the fifth race from opening day. It's a maiden special weight for two-year-old Philly New York. Reds going five and a half on the dirt. We're looking at the one hanging with Sonny. And I think we're going to see a couple of times in the races today. It's very important to keep in mind when the horses hit the break of the turn, and this is something you'll hear the MIG talk about quite a bit at different times, when they hit that break, if you are caught inside of horses, you will see horses seemingly drop back for no reason, and the reason is they're too close to the inside as they hit the turn, and they just basically get sort of steadied out without it appearing obvious. Uh, is that a thing that's unique to Saratoga, you think? No, I don't think it's says, unique or? to Saratoga, but I think it's more I think it's more pronounced here a lot, sometimes because of the two-year-old races. And we see uh, the you know, one horse hanging with Sonny down on the inside well before for the turn, he's kind of steadied out there in traffic already, losing position and uh, toward the back of the pack. Yeah, he'll end up shuffled way back to last in here after breaking the field. This actually is good a break as you'll see in a two-year-old race. And you see him make a move around here. It's not as though he does anything spectacular. What he did was he lost his position and he made a nice run to get into the race. Nothing spectacular, but hanging by with, with Sonny is a horse that is much better bred for the turf. And I think he's going to show up in a maiden turf race in his next start, Eric. Uh, I would agree with you there. And, you know, just thinking about this race, first of all, too. You know, you had two horses that are going to run a 1-2 here that had the experience. You have Hanging with Sonny, a first-time starter from the Bruce Brown Barn, who really doesn't do, you know, very good with numbers in terms of first-time starters winning uh, right right out of the gate there. So, you know, you have a horse that probably needed a little bit of experience running up, uh, you know, against a couple of horses that had experience, and you're right. A horse with some turf pedigree as well, who I think uh, needed the education first time out. And I don't think you're going to get some kind of super short price on him next time he runs, because despite finishing third, he was beaten almost 10 lengths in this race, and his buyer figure is going to come in around the 30 level, so it's not as though he's going to look particularly exciting going to his next race, and I think he's a horse that showed in this race. He has some ability, and perhaps when he has, now he has a little more experience, and perhaps he'll be in a different spot next time, a greener spot, that might be the right spot. All right, uh, older uh, maidens uh, for our second race of the uh, show here, going along on the turf, a mile on the 16th for New York Breds. We're going to look at the year four, Mr. Dooley, a first-time starter from Jimmy Bond. This was a kind of odd first-time starter, a four-year-old without a lot of pedigree in the other. Went off 20-1, to 1, which you could actually argue took a little bit of money in this field at 21, though Jimmy has a big following here. The horse broke slowly, as you can see, back in those pink silks. He has settled in the back of the pack, but right now he's on the inside, all the way inside that yellow horse on the rail, and you're going to see him steady out pretty severely from here. So broke slow, and then he's going to steady out severely, as you can see the rider having trouble. And after that, he does a good job getting into the race. And if not for his own bad acting, a first-time starter, and maybe that's why it took him so long to get the races, Eric, he might well have won this race. He very well could have. I mean, he's a uh, gelding for his first start here, so obviously the, the you know they probably had some behavior issues that they were addressing, you know, maybe throughout his two-year-old or three-year-old season as well, which is part of the reason for the uh, late uh, the late debut here for Mr. Dooley. But uh, toward the back of the pack here, and uh, really, you know, very much. Uh, Behind the eight ball here, you, I guess you could say. I mean, you have the behind uh, the eight ball. Behind the eight ball, yes. Uh, the seven wrap scallion, first time on the turf here. You know, getting off to a, uh, a fairly comfortable lead. It's also important to note that this was a race, and there he is, just getting in the picture, way way back. This is not exactly a race that collapsed. The horse who finished second was attending the pace the whole way. Sonny and Palio wins was no more than f fifth in this race, no more than a few lengths behind. At any point in the running, Hudson Miracle made a bit of a run in here, but Mr. Dooley was the one who made the big run. Now there were limited contenders in this race. But I still think when you consider the early trouble, you consider the run he made, a first-time starter, he ran very well. Now, he's going to benefit as a horse will from experience, and you're going to see what we're talking about in the stretch when you see how poorly he acts. But is this a horse that, you know, maybe he was got him, they got him as ready as they could first time out, and he's still a 40-year-old first-time starter, and there he is splitting horses there, and Louis Sice did everything right. This horse, Mr. Dooley, refused to cooperate. Does not cooperate here, lugging in throughout the entire stretch run. I mean, looks like he wants to make a run there, but uh, has horses inside of him, which is almost a good thing, because I was worried that he might go over the rail if he didn't have some horses inside of him there, but continually lugs in through the stretch. Sias cannot ride him, you know, effectively throughout the lane here, but uh, to only get beat in this spot, though, would he get beat here? 
four, two, two lengths or something like that. Yes, uh, got beaten just over two lengths. So got beaten. And, and the other thing is, when he was commencing his move in the stretch, he was basically going to be on the flank of the eventual close third place finisher, and in some ways going better than that horse. And that's when he lugged in badly and got in behind that horse. And then, as you said, he was outside of horses, or he would have gone right to the rail in there. He may have had more momentum than Hudson Miracle in going better than that one if he had stayed straight, and if Luis Ayas could have ridden him, and I think he would have won this race. As I was saying before, though, is he a horse? They had him ready today. He's a little bit green. Is he going to get rid of that greenness at age four in his second or third start? If he does, he'll beat this field next time he meets them. That's a big question. We'll see if they uh, come back with an equipment change uh, next time out. You know, this wasn't the strong. It wasn't. It was pretty, a pretty average field. It wasn't strong. It wasn't weak. So, you know, we'll see. I, I take my chances with him against this field next time out. But if he, you know, ran into a tougher spot, you know, I'd be a little bit leery. But uh, we'll see. Maybe Jimmy, uh, you know, I'll get him figured out after the first start here. I misspoke about uh, the horses that were in that race here. We'll take a look at our next race, uh, the second race on July 21st. This race has Rapscallion first time on the turf going a wire to wire here against the Open Companies, dummy. And uh, we'll take a look at a couple of horses near the four Invincible Mia, first time starter from Tom Amos and the uh, 10 horse Secretive coming back off the layoff for Sugar McGay. Yeah, I mean the first thing you'll see is the horse in pink and back. That's that's the first time starter, Invincible Me getting left and this was almost 20 to 1. Uh, Secretive will finish a very good third in here. He, he was, may well have been best in here. You can see how slow the pace was. And this is a perfect example of what the riders have to be aware of. If you have outside posts in one mile and or turf races. You've got to be decisive. You go or you look to get back and get position. We see too many guys just sort of sitting out there, not making a decisive decision, and it happens frequently. Listen, it's easy for us to sit here or me to sit here and tell these riders what they should do, but you see it far too often. Yes, it's a tricky course, but you see the kind of position, the secretive loss there. The horse we're talking about, Invincible Me, he's well in the back of the pack. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the rider on secretive was trying to do the right thing. You know, I don't think he wanted to be on the lead here, so he's trying to take back and save a little bit of ground that you know, turn comes up pretty quickly. The horse in front of him looks like he might have come out a path or two there, which might have carried Secretive out a little bit as well. But uh, the uh, four horse, the uh, first time starter, Invincible Me, toward the back, just getting on the screen there now with Rosie Napravnik, the gray, and the uh, pink silks. Yeah, listen, there's no doubt it's a very tough position to have that outside post in there, and Secretive just gets the worst of it the whole way around. But listen. Sometimes you wonder, and I think it's a lot of it is, you see the decisive ride that Alan Garcia gave the winner. He went to the lead. Everybody else grabbed. He went at a slow pace. He was able to dominate. Whether or not it would have been different if it had been more aggressive up front, who knows? If you secretive, maybe he goes a little bit more. You know the post jab. You have some time to think about it. Regardless, he got a lousy trip, whether it was nobody's fault or not. The first time star, Invincible Me, who breaks slowly and is well back in the pack, he makes a surprising big wide run before flattening out. He does indeed, and they'll uh, get uh, pretty close to the uh, 10 horse there. Uh, secretive as the uh, turn starts here, and uh, Rosie will make that move uh, with the number four horse, Invincible Me, on the outside now. So a horse that uh, broke slow toward the back of the pack, making a middle move in a race, first time starter. This is an excellent, excellent uh, debut race for uh, for Invincible Me, who I think will move forward next time out. I agree, and you, know, you look at the numbers for Tom Amos, who has a string here this summer. His numbers with first time stars in turf races is not good, so it's not surprised this horse needed a race, but I think this horse, Secretive ran very well, almost ran a win race in here. I think Invincible Me also ran extremely well. And this, unlike the last race, Eric, might have been a pretty good field. And when you think about the dynamics of a horse wiring the field in the front at a slow pace, both these horses ran extremely well. They did indeed and uh, would look forward to seeing them both back. I mean, both of them, you know, Shug's horse coming back off the long layoff there. Hadn't been out since 2012. And, uh, of course, the first time starter as well. Horses that probably needed the race in addition to not having things go their way. You know, we interesting was secretive because he ran well to be third here in his debut last year. And then he came to Belmont and met the tough Kinsey M. Monarch, but was a total no-show in that race. Will he be able to, will he repeat that next time or will he improve off this effort? We'll see because you have to imagine they'll run later in the meet. Back to the dirt for our fourth race in this episode of Trips and Traps, the opener from uh, July 22nd, maiden specialty for two-year-olds going five and a half. Yeah, and this is a, a, a maiden race where everybody's going to be focused on the winner, Big Sugar Soda, as perhaps they should be with a 93 buyer. But we want to look at two horses that break slowly. One of them is the four-horse strong mandate who ends up finishing fifth, and the other is the sixth grand arrival who finished third. I like both of these horses going forward. I'm particularly interested in grand arrival in here. Uh, both these horses get left, and both of them make middle moves and show a little something in a race behind a runaway winner. Yeah, I like these type of horses when you look for betting second time starters, you know, in, in their next race because you had a, you know, a dominant winner here in, in Big Sugar Soda who goes to the front end and draws off by eight and a quarter. So, you know, when you have a winner win by that big a margin, the other finishers in the race kind of don't look as good initially because they're so far back. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. And you have to just sort of keep everything in mind. That these horses are first time starters that can easily improve significantly. Just take the winner. The winner had run a dismal third or fifth with a 50 buyer in his first start. 
He's able to break sharply in this race, get to the front, and improve his buyer figure into the mid-90s. So it can happen very, very suddenly and very severely. And I think that this horse, Strong Mandate, we see making that four-wide move on the outside as we see Grand Arrival just getting going as well. And he had to do a lot of work again this race because not only he breaks slowly, he was more sluggish than Strong Mandate. Both of these horses showed something more so for me, Grand Arrival. Yeah, I think Grand Arrival ran a slightly better race, but Flatjack uh, took a you know good amount of play in here as well. Went off of four to one. I the wrong name. I apologize. <laughs> in in no. the face of uh, Big Sugar Soda, who wasn't even the favorite in there, that uh, role went to a financial mogul. But uh, both horses running uh, solid races for the debut, and I think will uh, benefit from from these efforts and uh, improve second time out. And thank you for pointing out it was Flatjack who finished seventh in this race. But don't be that discouraged by the seventh place finish. It's what they did during the running mm-hmm. of the race. The ultimate finish. Sometimes you're better off with them running worse than better in here. Maybe Grand Arrival ran a little too well for us because people are going to see, oh, it's an Exito horse, broke a step slow, made the middle move, finished up at the end. Oh, you're going to get about 580 next time this horse runs, no, maybe stretching out to seven furlongs. Depends what kind of Todd Pletcher killers are the race or not <laughs> and where we see the horse. I think Flatjack, despite it being a West Point horse, might be a little dirtied up and maybe we'll get a better price. All right, one more race to bring you. This is the eighth race uh, an allowance optional claimer. Now was the three for Phillies and Mares uh, on uh, July 22nd. We'll take a look at the three Deanna Allen's kit. This is a race we're showing mostly because we got an enormous amount of tweets and a lot of people were talking about this race, and there is little doubt that Deanna's Allen Kitten was extraordinarily unlucky in here. And Deanna Allen's Kitten breaks uh, you know, toward the uh, front of the pack in here, it is sitting in the uh, fourth spot now in the uh, familiar Ramsey Silks, the white uh, silks with the red cap there. And, you know, the, the pace is kind of establishing itself here a little bit with the one-horse Angel South going out there uh, to establish it, and uh, Deanna Allen's Kitten drops back a couple spots. Well, when, when Javier who, who Castellano, who's terrific at being aggressive with horses, oddly sort of decided to rate fantasy a flight instead of decisively going to the front. He changed the whole complexion of the race. A, he put his horse into a position where she didn't win the race. She did finish second, but she might have won if he went to the front. Um, but also, he, he bunched the field up. This was an inner track race, um, being run at Saratoga on our turf course with the best riders of the country. And they were going extraordinarily slow up front in here. And it enabled the horses up front to stick around and the closers to have no shot. Deanna's Allen Kitten, I guess... I thought people were unfairly harsh to Jose Lascano, who was dealt a lousy hand, a slow-paced race on a deep closer. I guess you want to argue maybe, and, you know, what else he's supposed to do, sort of letting her get sucked up on the inside at this point in the race. She ends up getting caught in that tough position and stayed out and squeezed out. Yeah, I mean, it is a tough spot to be in, and, you know, you can't say you should have done something else. You're not in that spot. You don't know whether the horse is hard, so to, tell, slowly, you know, you hard know. to tell the horse is coming over on you or not, too. So it loses some position there, gets shuffled back to last, and then is going to have to swing out wide to make a run for the stretch. Yeah. I just think he was dealt a bad hand here, to be honest with you. And I know people are going to say, well, he went up in there. Why didn't he hold that position? I think it's a very difficult position to hold because you're inside and it gets very tight in there. And you can say, well, why did he go up there in the first place? Well, they were going so slowly. Maybe she sort of carried him up in there. Maybe she saw, you know, some bit of an open space in front of her and ran into it. I mean, this is the kind of thing it's fun to talk to the MIG about in different situations and get his perspective on it. Regardless, she's the only horse that puts in a run, and she makes quite a run in here. Is it fair to say that she had about uh, five? Five or six lots of trouble in here, you think? No, I think that's that's, too that, much. that's a little bit aggressive, and I don't even know how you state it because, you know, it, what what is the fact that she was trying to close off of a very slow po- pace? What is that worth? How do you quantify that? That's a very hard thing to say. I mean, maybe if you analyze a lot of pace figures, but. I don't know how many lengths trouble because don't forget she also did save ground in here. She never right. lost any ground during the running of the race, particularly until the top of the stretch. And that, no, well, she angled out. Right. That's not that severe. So I don't know how much trouble she had. I know she was the best horse in the race, though. The problem is next time everybody's going to know she's the best horse in the race, and I, I still am not convinced she's as good as some people think she is. I, I'm a little apples and oranges with her. I, I'm going to have to evaluate where she runs. She may be overbet next time, especially as a Chad Brown horse. She's pretty consistent, though. She fires mm-hmm. every time. One more thing I want to discuss consistent. with you about this race you know there was a lot of talk opening week about uh, you know speed bias on, on the turf course and uh, you know this horse the winner of this race angel south stallion one you know doesn't really look like the type of horse that should win this race you have stakes winners in this race and peace preserver you obviously have fantasy of flight trying to dirt for the first time but you had a solid feel in here did the did, did, did the course the way it's playing carry this horse home N- not in my opinion I, I don't think so i think we i think the course has changed i mean we had a ton well, of rain, rain between friday Tuesday, and right? saturday no between friday and saturday we had a ton of rain don't forget we had all that rain mm-hmm. friday and saturday 
but Friday night. How is it that people just ignore the effect that might have had on the racetrack? And the other thing is, what do we run? Five, uh, ten races on each course, I think, something like that in the first four days. Well, is that really a sample you want to look at? And on each course, there were races where the speeds came back a little mm-hmm. bit, and a lot of them on one of the courses were, were turf sprints. Well, the nature of the beast, as Dave Lipton was saying on Talking Horses yesterday, is that speed is going to be favored somewhat in those turf sprints. You don't see races collapsing up here that much in the turf sprints. So I just think people are going over it. In my opinion, it was a dynamic situation, not a turf course with a bias. I think up here, the way the courses play, if you're a good speed horse, you're going to have every chance to go on with it and win. You know, I don't know how much of a bias that necessarily is, but you know, I think it kind of, you know, it, it favors speed in that way a little bit. Where if, if you, you've gotten away with a, a decent pace, you're not going too fast, and and, and you're in good form, or you're going to, you know, the horse is, is in solid shape, that they're going to have every opportunity to go on with it and get a win. Well, I mean, the mile in a race is maybe because they're conducive. To slower paces, hitting the turn so quickly. You know, if you look at this race, and we can talk about it, you know, Peace Preserver was a complete and total no-show. Mm-hmm. The greatest stakes source from California was a complete and no- total no-show. Uh, you know, what else were you going to have in the race? Two of the main players, arguably the two best horses on paper, and then Dina Allen's kitten is completely right. compromised, so why wouldn't the speeds do particularly well in here? Yes, it's surprising that Angel South won, but you know what? Why is it so surprising? Maybe Fantasy of Flight is much of a turf horse either. I just think this was a weird race where dynamics play the role, not the racetrack. People will disagree. That's what makes the racing world go round. It does indeed, and I guess we'll uh, get the uh, final verdict on uh, when these horses run back uh, out of these races, and we'll see you know, what uh, you know what kind of scenario plays into it uh, going forward. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point, and be careful with overstating some biases, but the other thing is, with this interesting racing up here, and a lot of turf racing, and two turn races on the turf up here, there's so many different trips taking place, and it makes the racing and the game much more interesting. All right. Well, this was uh, certainly a good uh, good debate here about the uh, speed bias on the uh, turf courses and uh, lots of good stuff up here at Saratoga. It's such good racing that, uh, you know, you have things to talk about every day in each race. It seems we like. do, and we have a lot of races to talk about, but we also want to talk about races you're interested in. And that's where you go, trips and traps at NairaInc.com. Thanks for watching.